Hey everyone, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat, a podcast recorded on the unceded sovereign lands of the Gayomago people by me, Liam Miller, he, him, he is a minister in the Uniting Church in Australia. Uh, I am very excited today to welcome to the, the podcast Sati Clark. Sati, welcome along. Thank you. So for anyone who doesn't know, I'm just going to give you a little of the bio here. Dr. Clark is a, uh, he holds the Bishop Sundo Chair in World Christianity at Wesley Theological Seminary in the US, where he is a professor of theology, culture, and mission. Uh, he is also a presbyter in the Church of South India. Uh, Dr. Clark bridges the world between establishment and the marginalized, the global and the local, and the academy and the congregation. Uh, he served uh, for several years at the United Theological College in Bangalore, India, and he was also a visiting professor at Harvard Divinity School. But he has taught all over the world, including very soon he will be, and he already has a little bit, but very soon he'll be teaching a course with the United Theological Seminary here in Sydney, uh, in North Parramatta, more specifically, uh, and that we'll talk more about that course toward the end, but there's some info in the notes below. So if you really enjoy listening to this interview and you want to go deeper that's one way you'll be able to do that if you're uh, if you're local so let's let's go back i guess you know let's go back a ways uh and and talk about you know no one becomes a theologian by accident um maybe no one becomes a theologian very logically but it's something that people become uh, and i'm curious how what what it was it that drew you i guess to yeah both theology, I guess, in the broad sense, and then specifically into thinking, actually, this is something that, you know, could be my my vocation, my my labor, my employment. Thank you, Liam, and um, thank you to all the listeners that, in fact, uh, have joined us in listening to this podcast. Uh, it's really a privilege for me to be in this country. I'm on a year-long sabbatical, um, after which I go back to uh, Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. but we have lived between really three countries, um, India, from where I've come um, and where I spent most of my life, the U.S., where I've spent close to 30 years of, uh, of my ministry and my life as a teacher of theology, and also in Australia, where we've been visiting regularly almost every year for the last 20 years. Uh, so this is in one sense uh, home for us and will uh, uh, be our home into the future mm. as we contemplate retirement. But you asked me uh, to go backwards and I've stayed in the present. All of us love <laughs> clinging to the present, don't we? Uh, so I uh, am I'm the sixth generation of consecutive ministers. Uh, the first of whom was the first to be ordained in India. So in one sense, we can say wow. I have uh, liturgical genes um, <laughs> that's been actually gifted to me. Mm. Um, but that's not why I became a minister and uh, a theologian. This was not to, to, to continue um, the, the family uh, tradition, uh, as it were, uh, in ministry. Um, I've uh, grown up with, with a wonderful uh, uh, father and mother. Um, 6.30 in the morning every day, there would be a gong. And four of us, which is they had four children, along with my mother and father and other helpers, uh, will come together, will sit on the floor, will sing a couple of devotional songs, and then there will be a Bible reading and prayer. This is about 20 minutes. Of course, mm. uh, all of you realize that I was uh, uh, not enthusiastic to wake up in the morning uh, <laughs> for this ritual. But yeah. what we learned is basically that much of what happens in the freedom of Jesus Christ is you open space in which you plead with God, but you also broker deals with each other toward peace and reconciliation mm. and love. Uh, and I think this was also helpful because the family prayers had the helpers. Mm. So we all sat together as though we all shared the image of God. And we basically stoked that in each other mm. in a way to glow for the light, which we knew was Jesus Christ. So I grew up within that, but for strange reason, um, 
even though my father was rooting that one of the three of his sons will become a minister, uh, I always said I would not. Uh, I, I have a streak of disobedience and it exhibited itself that way. However, when my parents moved away from me and I was in a boarding school, um, this is during, just before I entered university, I thought to myself that I would love to serve the way my father and mother served God without leaving other human beings outside of the service. Mm -hmm. And so it was at that point, without my parents there, but I suddenly said, I really want to be a minister to serve human need in such a way that I also was serving God. I never thought these two things were separate. Mm. And so I gave myself up to the call to be in full-time ministry, went on then for my theological education, um, and then came back and worked for my father, who was the Bishop of Madras in a very large diocese in the Church of South India. And he was my boss for three years. Uh, I worked and lived with untouchable communities um, in rural India, uh, really people that were dirt poor and yet rich in dignity. And I worked for them for three years. And in a strange way to escape my father's supervision of me as bishop, I chose graduate study. So then I moved to the US, uh, eventually uh, did a master's and then a, a doctorate. And in one sense, I can say, it was a road that was chosen from, for me. And I often think of this as almost a default position away from what my calling was, which was to be a minister. Mm. But of course, all of us can scheme things in the way we are called to do. And so my students basically are people that I form and guide for leadership for the role of being shepherd among mm. primarily those who actually are lost among our sheep. So in many ways, I've combined both of those. I've never been a theological teacher without also serving as an associate minister. Mm. So I've always kept both of them close together in my years in India and in the US. Mm. So that's really how I came into being a minister of the gospel and then a theological mm. teacher. And I hold them both very closely together. Mm. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you for that. Um, so as you then start to do theological work out of grad, after graduate school, um, like what, 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 I guess, you know, you're known for, you know, your early work on, on Dalit theology and Dalit liberation theology. So how did, you know, was your particular you know, theological commitments, interests and scope begin to shape in that, that early work? Um, particularly, I guess, as you're, you're already in that space, you've added that second home, right? That, that the US uh, as well as India. Um, so I'm curious about that, that you know, you kind of early theological work there and, and, and how those, I guess, commitments that run through, um, you know, shaped and, and, and informed the work as you began to do it. So, uh... My living among Dalit communities, and just to say a word, we're not talking about a small group of human community that was pushed out as untouchable, uh, and they've reclaimed the word Dalit, which means broken. Uh, so they're basically the broken community. Um, and this community is more than 200 million in India and still struggle with. Um, structural discrimination. Um, and, and so my living with them for three years uh, told me in a sense that I lacked a double baptism. Uh, I had one baptism, which was in the waters of a church in the city um, that must have been quite privileged. Um, and so I was baptized into that water, all in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Creator, 
redeemer and sustainer. But when I went there, I realized if I wanted to serve that same triune God and be part of the energy and flow of that triune God into the lives of the people that I was working in, I had to also accept a baptism into sometimes what I thought was the mucky pond of local life, which was basically the broken life of broken people. And so those three years basically allowed me to be baptized into the living waters of human suffering. And in many ways, it was after this baptism that the first baptism as well became broader, mm. more deep in terms of human need and suffering. And that is what I brought both to my ministry, but also mm. my theology. Mm. In many ways, uh, Liam, uh, I, I feel I live in this wonderfully fertile in-between. In between the knowledge that was given and is being given to me at world-class academic institutions and the wisdom that still is gifted to me by being in solidarity and mm. walking alongside the community of the poor, the mm. marginalized, and those who have been othered. And so I think a lot of my own theology erupts from this in-betweenness. Mm. And both of these really matter to me. So I always tell my students, and I've taught now for 25 years in different institutions, I always tell my students that your commitment to the task of theology also needs to be refined by a commitment to an actual concrete group of people. Mm. So you're not doing theology only because you feel that you're bright and you have new ideas <laughs> and this is somehow you illuminate something within yourself, but you actually have to make the contract, almost a covenant with mm. communities on whose behalf also you decide you will think theologically. Mm. And I think this is an important clue for all of us as individuals, as disciples of Jesus Christ, it's not just actually having a theology that works for me. Mm. It is to find and covenant with the community and say, this also makes meaning for them so that life is restored to the fullness that God wants to offer all creation. Mm. I think that's, that's wonderful. It's, it's so helpful, as, as, as you say, of... of thinking about it, who 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 from you know who you're in relationship with and solidarity with um in particular i think is is so helpful um i guess thinking about how you know the, the the long stretch of now that you've been teaching and working in theology and you know you've been able to be drawn in to many other communities that like obviously different but but share probably a lot of that you know that being marginalized that being um dirt poor that being you know Oppress, you know, both the, you know across the globe and within the US uh, and things like that. How have you found that, you know, both that kind of almost universality of suffering, um, you know, I guess connects with or, or informs or shapes the very particular, like this is that community that that from from which you know I had that second baptism, that double baptism, from which I have this you know solid commitment to. Um, you know, yeah, as it expands out and you go, yes, there is this kind of global sense of, you know, the poor or the who, who, who might it be with their own particularities and challenges, but that has a, a way of shaping how we begin to, you know, thinking not just from this particular, but from this kind of global um, sense. So um, I really believe that all universal needs, all universals, Need, needs to be stitched mm. from local particulars mm. mm -hmm. and particularities. Um, I think the dimension of pushing for a universal that is not 
answerable to and is not derived from mm. particularities of local communities tends to be a form of dominating or colonizing local communities. Mm. So I do think there is a universal that we all are part of, whether it is the experience of God, whether it is the promise of liberation, salvation, wholeness, or whether it is an indictment of sin hmm. and fallenness. But I think what we need to realize is that this needs to be weaved together from the ground, distinctly aware that every claim to universality by a particular community mm. needs to be accountable to other forms of particularity, mainly because we believe that God in Jesus Christ and through the power of the Spirit has saturated all of life, mm. Mm. every human being, and all of creation. So I really think that a lot of what I do as a theologian is not to be concerned about how can we reach a universality abstractly, but much more about how do we accept the burden and the privilege mm. by the power of God to stitch together the universal under which all of us with the symbol of God, the Trinity, will be accountable. Mm. So a lot of what I do is to hug the local, as it were, knowing that in hugging the local, one also hugs basically all that is strange to who I am, and realizing that it is in the strangeness that one also encounters the Jesus that one has missed because yes. you have universalized this to such an extent that you have actually forgotten that this Christ still lives, moves, and has being in the hungry, mm. the one who's in prison, the naked, the one that is sick, and those who are oppressed. And so I think this is primarily what it is. So my role really is to continuously work for ways in which we can fashion the garment of universality mm. under God, the triune one, so that all of us can be accountable, but none of this accountability takes away anything from our own deep experience of who God has been with us and for mm. us. Mm. Oh, thank you for that. That's that's really great and helpful. So um, we, I, I kind of teased it at the start that you'll be teaching uh, an intensive at United Theological College on this uh, contemporary theology in a global context, which is uh, running from the 15th to the 19th of November. Uh, so I want to talk a bit about teaching global theology and teaching world Christianity or these kind of um, projects. I mean, I have a few different angles I want to take here, but um, I guess one of the things I wonder is in teaching such a course, again, is that kind of question of universality and partiality that, that runs through, right? That we're saying that there is something that links these very diverse, distinct, particular theologies, um, but also they are, you know, distinct and, and, and that, and I think, you know, it's probably tough and especially in a, you know, 12 weeks, let's say, um, to, to, to kind of craft that. Um, so I guess, you know, I'm curious a bit about your, your thinking and approach to when, you know, having, having taught this and, and thinking about teaching it again, these kinds of courses, how you kind of balance that there's this thing, of, you know, of, of global Christianity or world Christianity um, that as an organizing category, but also one that, you know, potentially flattens some of the particularity um, and, and reinforces, you know, a certain, um, you know, assumptions of, of, of a, you know, a derivativeness or something like that. So, yeah, curious a bit about, about how that um, tension plays. So that's a really very good question, Liam, because this is um, part of the unfinished agenda 
for most theologians, even though we pretend as though we've got it right and we can teach you what it means to actually hold together the universal and the particular, particularly when one looks at the shrinking world um, that really is part of our globalized uh, planet, right? So what I've done is to employ a strategy of bringing to students three contexts, their local, their regional, and looking at these three contexts as somewhat different from each other, but represent the fullness of the voices of global Christians. And so what we will do in this course is to look at these contexts. So for example, the three contexts are the context of religious pluralism and the option between the clash of religions, which is because of the growth of fundamentalism, and the option of reconciled peace that leads towards justice for all. So the first context we look at, and we'll go primarily to South Asia and also the Middle East, because there is where, for example, Islam, Christianity has much more of a conflictual stance, at least when we look at the globe today. So we'll go into that context. And so we'll look at Asia, Indonesia is included within this because this is part of the context within that. And then look at the context of conflict, religious pluralism, and the options towards pathways of peace. So that is one context that we will look at. And then we'll move to Latin America and look at that context as being primarily the economic takeover of an oligarchy mm. that in fact takes away the ability for all to participate in the fullness of life that God has gifted all of us. Mm. And so we'll look at Latin American theology and then the kind of emergence of that within the context in the US as to how class mm. and elements of race are part and parcel of this. One cannot leave this out. Mm. And so this is another context. So the whole idea that freedom and liberation cannot be experienced on earth as it is in heaven without also having sufficiency mm, mm. of the means to live out one's life as fully as possible. So that's the second context. And then third, we will look at Pacifica. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm increasingly realizing, and this comes uh, 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 um, as, as a form of, of self-confession. I'm realizing a lot of my theology has basically taken the soil and land as foundation. And so a lot of the whole idea of liberation is, can we get some land? How do we mm -hmm. equally dispute resources within the land? Whereas in many ways, Pacifica and Oceana in general come out of a foundation of the oceans and the seas. So mm. what will this context of thinking basically alongside the ocean? So the earth, obviously, as all of us know, is 71% water. Mm. But most of us don't conceptualize this. And this could be because of the Hebrew example of often water actually thinking of as, as somewhat part of the unruly, even slightly demonic forces, right? So what does it mean then to ground one's thinking and theology based on ocean rather than soil mm. and how this actually lends for a much more ecological way mm. of thinking about theology? So what I'm trying to do is to bring three specific contexts mm. that are associated with continents 
and then allow students the opportunity to see, on the one hand, which context basically they really want to do theology from, mm. but also realize that the universal form of global theology cannot leave out our siblings who work within very different contexts. Because I think in the end, what we can teach each other is how do we source our experience correlate that with scripture in order to come up with theologies that express our own localities, our context, mm. and our gifts of culture, and yet with an awareness that is a, there is a surplus outside of who we think we are, mm. and that one must take on if one thinks about Christianity as a global movement, a global theological reflective exercise. Mm. Oh, thank you for that. And that's a great plug. People, I, I'm excited. Uh, pe people should get, get very excited about, because I think that's such a, yeah, a, a fruitful way of approaching it. And, and, and it is one of those things of, you know, that, that really not taking kind of an epistemological starting point as given, right, or as natural, um, you know, and, and allowing that to be you know opened up and spilled over and, and become aware of what else there and, and see what that then opens up um that we wouldn't have thought about before in, in, in right. text or in liturgy or in other kinds yes of and and just to make a, a plug for this mainly because I, I i teach for communities to empower mm. them to claim who they are and what they ought to be for the reign of god that is close at hand that is waiting to be grasped almost Right. Mm. So uh, also to encourage uh, uh, your, your uh, viewers that if, if, if they want to audit just part of it, if they want to audit the course, there's a way in which you can audit this. And I will work with auditors almost as a separate community that, in fact, may just be interested in one of the segments that I'm working with. So uh, do keep that in mind. And, mm. and uh, uh, you know, through you, you can direct them to me. They can send me an email and I'm willing to send out basically the syllabus so that they know what it is and how they may, even if they can't register for the whole intensive, uh, yep. be part of this journey. Mm. Oh, that's great. You mentioned um, just earlier, like, you know, um, religious fundamentalism, the rise of religious fundamentalism. And I know that's been a topic of some of your recent work uh, has been on that. And, and again, I was thinking about, you know, the the study of theology uh, and what theology potentially has to offer, you know, what was explored, what it does in terms of opening ourselves to the others. Um, but particularly, I think, you know, it's often talked about, you see it bemoaned, like, you know, lack of religious literacy within media, within wider culture and how that, you know, leads to such shallowness i guess in the sense in the way we kind of talk about often fundamentalism or religious conflict or or you know the pluralism and secularism or so many of these things are uh that so i was thinking about you know how you felt you know doing this work and and you know and, and teaching theology for a long time and this on yeah on a bit of what theology can or the study of theology and the study of religion can offer you know in that sense of making us better participants in these kind of very live conversations, better, uh, more fluid uh, understanding what's going on. Now, you can't get everyone to take a theology course who you think should, but there's a sense of that, you know, it's such a force at play um, and, and you know, we're often so adrift in how we respond, you know, when we see so much out there. So I was thinking about, you know, particularly with that, you know, that's often one of the reasons religion gets in the news, you know, is, is right. attached to fundamentalism right. and things like that. How, how that work has shaped how you think about this, the role of theology and the study of religion in, in trying to contribute to not only a public good, but a public discourse. Right. Uh, uh, I, I uh, learned that that is one of the most important parts of formation of of, of ministers and where theological education should be involved um, very early mm. in the lives of ministerial students. Um, and, and I've done this over the last uh, 15 years at Wesley Theological Seminary. Uh, exactly what you were talking about, Liam, that is basically how do we uh, 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 really fight um, uh, uh, the kind of religious illiteracy that many of us Christians 
uh, 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 have uh, when it comes to other religious traditions, right? Mm. So, so I always tell my students uh, 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 that what I want them to realize is just there's nothing actually that is taken away from us when we're able to speak the truth about other religions, just like we proclaim the truth about our own. Mm. It's, it's very important. Uh, otherwise, basically, we're in the game of sowing lies in order mm. to reap truth somehow. Mm. <laughs> uh, it cannot be done, uh, uh, except actually uh, with the posture of, 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 of lies, deceit, and a colonizing of the other um, against their will and without them knowing. Mm. Right. So mm. it's very important. I think that every seminary has to have a course on world religions. Um, and so I've evolved that over the last 15 years, but, but it's, it's gone through so many different iterations. Mm. Um, and, and what I've always thought is that what we need, not just for theological uh, uh, students who will be ministers, but for every disciple of Jesus Christ, we should aim in our formation of disciples to basically forge passionate Christians who are also compassionately interreligious. Mm, mm. I think we thought that both of them cannot go together. <laughs> we think that we should actually be uh, 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 passionate in denouncing other religions rather than be compassionate in our disposition, attitude, and our posture towards every other religion. And I'm finding that that is the key for evangelism, mm. that we actually show forth that indeed we have been molded by the spirit to be passionately Christian mm. and yet also compassionately interreligious. Because love overflows in the gospel and not mm. judgment. Mm. So I, I, I think there's a lot that we can do and, and I would like to be involved with this in Australia with, with, with this formation of discipleship, mm. but also formation of ministers. Uh, some of this also is, is visiting other communities when they're in a posture of prayer mm. to see the ways in which, in fact, we might be able to learn and might be able to respect how other people plead <laughs> with our common creator. That the common creator, who is also the redeemer and sustainer, will draw close to them as well. And I particularly in, 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 the, in the 15 years I've taught, I've had three evenings in which students have to give me three hours through a semester in which I accompany them into a Buddhist meditation house, into a Hindu temple into a Jewish synagogue and into an Islamic mosque. Simply for us to realize that in being with them, we're open mm. to the God of grace, the God of common grace, and because God created, ought also to be involved in embracing, freeing, and caring every creature that is part of God's loving gift mm. to the world. Mm. Mm. Thank you for that. That's wonderful. Well, thank you for your time and for this conversation. Uh, just to reiterate again, the course is running at United Theological College uh, in North Parramatta or on Zoom, which is important, available also on Zoom the 15th to the 19th of November, 9 30 to 4 30 each day and as Sati mentioned um you know a wonderfully generous offer to talk about for folks who want to audit it and how they can think about how this learning can can you know foster and fuel their discipleship and formation in their particular communities with their particular struggles and questions and hopes so please do check that out and if it's on zoom that's that opens it up to a whole lot of folks so please do uh check that out and if you can't check that out um Dr. Clark has a lot of wonderful books that you should check out and uh, and, and look up and, and, and pick up for yourself. Uh, is there anything else you want to draw people's attention to? Any final things you want to want to offer out there? I, I think just for us who are 
Christian disciples um, who also are leaders. Uh, there's something that my father taught me that I've never forgotten, and I pray to God that I will never forget. He was, of course, the bishop in Madras, uh, became the deputy moderator of the Church of South India, and served um, in, in probably one of the wealthiest and well-known dioceses uh, in South Asia, um, Madras or Chennai. But when I became a minister and then went on to become a teacher, then a professor, he'd always tell me, Sati, let your discipleship always go before your leadership. So in one sense, I always have taken from that and said, discipleship is part of our pedagogy. Mm as teachers, as preachers, as disciples. So I just want to leave you with that thought because that mm. is something that I still hold very dear to my continued formation as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Mm. Oh, thank you for that. It is a wonderful uh, encouragement to end on. I appreciate that a lot and I appreciate your time and I look forward to seeing you around the college and uh, once we can, you know, actually step foot in it. And, uh, and folks, thanks all for listening. We'll see you next week. Uh...